rough jagged edges on it. And on top of that rough jagged portion, there's this vibration quality, a very coarse vibration that takes place. Okay. So, you know, it takes some time to develop a certain uh, familiarity with all these pulse qualities that I'm talking about, which is one of the things that we do in the hands-on portion of these classes. Um, but I think if you pay attention, rough vibration is one of those things that over, if you, if you're looking for it, 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 it will stand out. And, you know, there's always gradations of things and in, in Shen Hammer, we rate all these pulse qualities uh, on a scale of one to five. So one is a really mild, subtle quality and five would be something like, it's kind of like punching you in the face and you're, you're going to notice it. Right. Um, so, uh, but essentially you want to be aware of this kind of, um, this vibrating quality over the fingertip and this lack of smooth contour it is, you know, it, it's hard because we have other qualities that have similarities. We have uh, a pulse that is choppy. We have a pulse that has a smooth vibration and then we have rough pulses that don't vibrate. Um, but, um, the, the vibration is something where you, it's, it's one of the more, um, it's one of the more common and obvious things to perceive because it's something it, where smooth vibration feels like it's tickling your finger, but this rough vibration feels more like it's a buzzing feeling. It's very coarse and grating on the fingertip. Okay. So that's our real patho mnemonic finding. And then we're looking at the rate to see what's happening at the rate. Okay. There's a couple of other qualities that are common with heart shock. One is the flat pulse and the flat pulse is really a unique pulse to the left distal position. And it indicates that the trauma occurred when the individual was really young or very weak constitutionally, or that the event was of an overwhelming intensity, right? Remember it's constitution or age or maturity, all, all these things are going to play a role in, in the, in what develops. So, on the opposite side of that, you may have someone who has an inflated quality and that would show up where the person was in a relatively robust situation when the trauma occurred. And so a flat pulse is basically a pulse that occurs in the left distal position, very, very deep. You have to keep pressing in and it's really devoid of any type of waveform, right? It's a, I, I may have a picture of it here. If I do, I, I on the next slide, I'm not sure if I do, but I can find one for you uh, if we don't have one here right now. And then the inflated pulse is like this feeling of like a fully inflated balloon, no matter what level of pressure you're palpating on, whether you push in or release up, it still has this real full inflated balloon feeling to it. Now, we also have a tight pulse and a tight pulse can reflect emotional and or physical pain. It can reflect um, nervous system tension or a nervous system weak conditions and hypervigilance. And it's also a finding of um, activity in the sinew channels. All right. So a tight pulse is what we're talking about in the Schenhammer lineage of a tight pulse. It's a pulse that is pretty thin and very hard, right? So we may have a pulse that if you think about, um, if you take like a, a rubber band and you very gently um, stretch the rubber band, that would be what we call a taut pulse, right? So it's fairly wide. It's, it still has a good amount of resiliency. If you keep stretching it, it gets a little narrower and a little harder. And that's what we call a tense pulse. If you keep going, it gets really, really narrow. And then it gets harder. That's a tight pulse. And if you go even further to the point where like it's starting to fray apart and that inside of it is so thin and tight and hard and it feels like it's going to snap, that's a wiry pulse, right? Really thin and hard, right? Um, and that's a sign of essence and gene deficiency or extreme pain, okay? Um, but that's basically the basic, and you can, I think I, again, picture my textbook of the different levels of, of qualities and what they mean and so forth, all right? The other really common thing on a heart shock pulse is these rhythm changes. And we're gonna discuss rhythm in a little bit. Um, and then this smooth vibration, which is that tickling sensation. That's a person who is constantly worrying about something. All right. And you may find a smooth vibration on someone's pulse every time you see them. And that just means that they're a constant worrier. And you may see it on someone's pulse just every now and again, where there's something on their mind that they're worrying about. So the more consistent it's there, the more depth that it presents at, the more embedded that um, state of mind is in their constitution. Okay, so again, we rate things on a scale of one to five. 
five of the rough vibration is like really, really vibrating and very rough and, and really buzzing on your fingertips. Distracting you from feeling other things. Um, we also look at it in terms of superficial to deep and left to right. So initially when a trauma hits, if it's confronting the nervous system, primarily you may see it only on the chi depth. And eventually as it goes deeper into the pulse and you find it everywhere, you know, it's like the deeper levels of the pulse are more uh, reflecting adaptive conditions, right? So these, these, these are things that are chronic at this point, things that they've been dealing with a long time, right? And at, at some point, Dr. Hammer and Dr. Shen had made this comment that um, initially you may find a trauma on the left side and then eventually it goes to the right side. I've never seen this. I've only ever seen vibrations on both left side and right side simultaneously. I don't think I've ever found it. Sometimes you find it's like more prevalent on one than the other for a variety of reasons. Um, but just to you know, throw it out there and if you, if you feel it on the left versus the right, it might be kind of an incipient uh, trauma, something that's happened in the recent past. Um, the interesting thing about the rough vibration and how this ties also into classical Chinese medicine is that a rough vibration is a sign of an eight extra channel issue, right? And these, of course, are issues that relate to our deepest UN level and affect us to our core. And eight extra channel pulses, which I detail in the book in, in a separate chapter, are long, are for, for the most part, long pulses. Well, I shouldn't say for the most part. They're, some of them aren't, but um, pulses like the yin wei mai, the yang wei mai, uh, the do, the ren, the chong, those are long pulses, meaning that they, they uh, occupy more than one position, right? And they feel like whether it's occupying two positions or three positions, depending on whether it's a, a first trinity pulse, which is the do mai, ren mai, and chong mai, they occupy all three positions simultaneously at different depths. And they, it, feels, it feels like one pulse, right? It's not like you're, you feel something in two different places and one feels tight and one feels you know, reduced or something. They're going to feel like the exact same quality, hitting both fingers with the exact same sensations, okay, at the depths that, they, that they're found on. And they also have this rough vibrating quality when they're showing active pathology in them. So it's just a, another corroborating finding where we would say, oh, rough vibration is this finding of a systemic instability. That's something that affects us to our core. And we know that eight extra channel pulses also have this kind of vibrating quality to them as well. And then uh, another um, interesting component to the eight extra channels is that when we're looking at how do we access eight extra channels in terms of pulse, uh, in terms of um, needling technique, right? The way you needle a particular point determines its function to some degree, right? So it is lots of points have multiple functions. You know, how do you know that um, lung seven is not a lung channel point or a low point, you know, rather than um, looking at it as an opening of the renmai? It depends on how we're needling it, right? So the needling technique is specifically what we call a shaking or a trembling or a vibrating quality. We take the needle and we get into our deep depth and we kind of like vibrate it really, you know, really rapidly if we're trying to sedate the area or very slow vibrations if we're trying to um, tonify and um, supplement the channel. So again, all these things, like it, it, it's not, it's not uh, a surprise that fear causes us to shake, that trauma creates the shaking response, that to access the eight extra channels re requires a shaking needling technique and that rough vibrations are the pulse of eight extra channel activity and it's the finding of heart shock on the pulse, right? So all these things, they're not, it's not coincidence, right? And again, this idea of hexagram 51, right? When people, when quake thunder comes, people sh shiver and shake, but then they whoop it up with talk filled with laughter, right? So all these, these ideas of, uh, and to some degree, you know, we can look at it too is, that shaking, that that um, that thunder that comes in, that's that's something that is requiring change, right? There's no option but to change and adapt. It, the, the pathology comes from not adapting and not changing, right? Which is where wind comes from, of course, too. And pointing out, um, you know, to Kelly's question earlier, with seizures and so forth, you know, normally you would shake that out and release it. 
You can't. It's trapped internally. You don't have the ability to externalize it and release it from the system. So it gets hardwired into the nervous system and can create that type of activity, right? So when we look at these pathognomonic findings of a heart shock scenario, and we combine the concepts of rate with rough vibration, this is one of the main ways that we are able to date the time that the traumatic event occurred, right? So for example, if I'm, diet, if I'm feeling the pulse on a 50 year old patient and I'm feeling a rough vibration and her heart rate is in the eighties, pretty certain that that was something that happened not that long ago, right? If, for example, I'm feeling that same patient's pulse, but her heart rate is in the 40s, we can say, well, gee, this is something that would have taken decades for a heart rate to get down to 40 something beats per minute. And so this is probably something that happened, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? In her childhood. And especially if there's an arrhythmia, I can say, well, it even happened before her first menstruation. quality of the kidneys, are they really deep, feeble, absent, are they empty, we can even keep going and look at other corroborating factors to help us time and understand how far into the past and how deeply embedded this trauma is, okay? Hi Ross, I'm just going to interrupt, we have a couple questions. Great. 